Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Cybersecurity During Quarantine, this morning's webinar. This webinar is presented by the Beverly Hills Bar Association Lab Practice Management and Technology section. If anyone is interested in joining the executive committee for the section so that they can help plan or organize similar programs on technology, lab practice management, or solo or small firm management, they should reach out to uh, to us at the Beverly Hills Bar Association, and I'll put my contact information in the chat shortly, or go to the section webpage at bhba.org. Our speaker this morning is Ken May, CEO of SwiftChip, uh, Beverly Hills Bar Association member benefit provider. Overall, awesome guy, and as you'll see in just a moment, knows IT really, really well. So Ken, take it away. Thank you very much, my friend. I really appreciate the opportunity to help educate our community here. And uh, that's what it's really all about, right? Is uh, especially during these these tough times is making sure we've got an our community. So uh, folks, I will uh, uh, in between slides, uh, flip back and forth between the chat uh, box. So please feel free to ask questions um, if you like. Um, there's enough attendees here that if you use the raise hand function, I probably won't have a chance to see it because I'd have to screw everybody. Um, but feel free to uh, post it in the chat if you have a question, and I'll uh, I'll do my best to catch those and answer them as we go. Um, the purpose of this call is not to be uh, super technical, uh, but it's supposed to be accessible for for a wide variety of folks, and uh, we're going to cover a lot of different topics. Um, some of the things that we'll talk about, I won't necessarily expect uh, everybody to implement, uh, but if you come away from this webinar with just a, a few new ideas on how to protect yourself, then I think it'll be well worth your time. So let me go ahead and start sharing my PowerPoint here. All right, and uh, can you guys see that, uh, that slide okay? Yes, I think so. The answer is yeah. You see it? I see it. Okay, excellent. All right. So um, how do we keep our people safe during quarantine, including ourselves? It's tricky to try to figure out how can we possibly continue doing business as usual, right? There are many, many, many businesses that for a long, long time have been under the impression that they could only operate in a more traditional office-based format. And there are some businesses that absolutely uh, have to operate in person. For example, entertainment type uh, businesses, especially being so close to Hollywood, I've got lots of friends that are involved with um, working with uh, concerts and things like that. And there's not much that they can do. But for some of us that have more um, office type jobs, um, it's definitely possible to be able to move a lot of the stuff to the cloud. And at this point, hopefully, most people have uh, already set up some sort of remote worker type systems. Uh, we were, um, the benefits of, say, some good planning um, in that uh, we had already set up remote access capabilities for all of our uh, clients. So when the time came, uh, we spent the first two weeks of quarantine basically just simply um, configuring the accounts for people, but we already had everything already in place. I guess I should mention, uh, in case it's not clear, uh, my company SwiftChip is a managed IT services company. So we, we act like outsourced IT support for our clients. So luckily there was no additional cost for any of our folks and uh, we already had everything in place. But it's not necessarily as obvious uh, for some businesses. And um, there have been a lot of businesses that had initially shut down, um, but now with uh, some of the benefits that are coming to encourage um, businesses to be able to operate, they're starting to look about at, uh, okay, how can we start back up? Uh, how can we move to a remote collaborative environment? Flip over really quick and see if I see any questions here. Q&A, there we go. You can uh, you can only the Q and A function to uh, ask me questions directly here too. Here we go, chat. There we go. Okay, just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. All right. So what's coming next? Um, so far, the quarantine's been extended to at least May fifteenth. 
it seems like there's a lot of expectation that that will most likely continue even further. Um, but it's difficult to speculate right now, considering how quickly everything is continuing to move. Um, there's been some discussion that uh, even if there's a slow reopening of business, uh, large public gatherings and uh, concerts and other sporting events and things like that may not be allowed until sometime next year, possibly. So there's still potentially a lot of disruption out there, including supply chain disruption. So not just the businesses directly, but those businesses being able to get access to all the different services and materials that they need to be able to operate, right? So it's going to be difficult to be able to sell products if you can't get your own products in from a distributor in the first place, right? Um, John, I see your question about Zoom, and believe me, that's one of the number one things on my list coming up. So we'll definitely make sure and, uh, and get to that shortly. Uh, more businesses are still continuing to lay off workers and shut down, which is unfortunate, but there is some relief. Uh, so I'm sure at this point, most of you have already heard about um, the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, uh, the COVID-19 Economic Injury and Disaster Loans, the EIDL. Um, those are um, really specifically uh, designed to make sure that businesses that have been impacted uh, by all the things we already spoke about are still going to be able to uh, keep people employed and to float them along until things are able to get back to some semblance of, of uh, normal. I'm not going to go into detail about these things because I'm not really a financial guy and I'm sure you folks are probably fairly well informed on those already. Um, I'm sure you've already heard that um, besides the 12 hour stimulus check, um, people are also eligible for unemployment plus an extra $600 a week, which is causing a fair amount of people that may have been in a more minimum wage type situation to make more on unemployment than they did from when they had a job. So we may be seeing some interesting challenges with getting people reemployed uh, as long as those are in place. So it's entirely possible that we may have some work shortages coming up depending on what happens there. So interesting stuff. Okay, so let me dive right into it. And like I said to any specific questions, please feel free to uh, jump into it. Um, John, I'm marking your questions answered since I'm about to talk to it right now. So Zoom jumped right to the forefront of uh, popular applications for uh, collaboration, for video chat, for, uh, for sharing. And uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, it had already been growing in popularity, partly because it was intensive and it seemed to work fairly well um, and had some advantages over things like Skype um, or even Microsoft Teams. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Microsoft Teams, um, it's Microsoft's answer to um, unified communication um, and collaboration, such as um, other uh, solutions out there like uh, Slack. Um, and it's grown quite a bit. I'm not a huge fan of the interface, um, but just simply due to the fact that it's a Microsoft product, we're going to be seeing the popularity of it growing immensely, I think. Um, so we're going to continue to see that growing. And they have been adding a lot of functionality. It's right now trying to play feature catch up with Zoom, um, but it's getting close. Uh, depending on licensing, it can either be free or you can have some premium licensing to do uh, other things like direct video calls like Skype. Um, Hillary mentions you can only see four people at a time on Microsoft Teams. Um, that uh, was true. And I just saw uh, an email from Microsoft, I want to say earlier this week or last week, that said that they, tournament, they either expanded it to nine, I think they expanded it to nine, and that they were working on expanding it to 16 for the next uh, bit, and then even further to something like 49. Um, so they're, they're working on it. Uh, but anyway, uh, a lot of businesses were already using Zoom for webinars, and so it uh, kind of quickly jumped to the forefront. Um, there have been a lot of security concerns and there have been some vulnerabilities discovered in Zoom so far, but what we in the information security field are really focused with is looking at, okay, how is a company responding to the disclosure of a vulnerability? Are they ignoring it or are they acting quickly on it? And so far, Zoom has been doing a pretty good job. Um, I have my own opinions about it, but I wanted to dig around in, in my um, 
community and see what other security professionals were saying. And it seems like generally speaking, uh, folks are pleased with how quickly um, they've been responding. They've been pushing out fixes within one or two days, which is just pretty solid. There was initial concern uh, because of issues with something called Zoom bombing, where people didn't quite seem to get the idea that if you post a link to a meeting that doesn't fire a password, anybody that has the link to the meeting could join that meeting and then potentially post inappropriate things. Um, really, it's kind of a matter of training, um, making sure people understand, hey, uh, maybe we don't want everyone to be able to get into this uh, meeting just by clicking a link. Um, Zoom decided that they would uh, an extra step on that and um, require a password by default when you're creating new meetings. Um, you can still, of course, turn that off. Um, is uh, sometimes something people will do. Um, they also enabled the uh, waiting room functionality. So a moderator would specifically have to admit everyone in the meeting. <clears throat> so they would be more easily able to catch potentially someone who's not supposed to be there. And then they simplified the uh, security options to make sure that it was easier for people to, for example, uh, disable attendees from being able to share their things. So uh, it's less likely that somebody is going to join and then uh, start displaying an inappropriate image or something like that. There are still some ways around that. Um, it is possible to use a uh, piece of software that acts like a virtual webcam. And instead of it actually connecting to your camera, what it does is it can play a video. So um, if you're concerned about that, let's say it's a meeting where there's minors involved or something like that, you might simply want to have attendees only be able to join in audio only mode so they can't share their webcam or their screen. Um, there's also issues uh, I've been reading uh, that people are just simply getting naked on webcam and that's obviously not a good thing either. Um, I'm a member of the FBI's InfraGuard uh, program, which is a public-private partnership where they share um, information, security information, sometimes before it actually even goes to the press. And so they've been sharing quite a bit of information on that. What that basically boils down to is make sure you have a password for any publicly shared meetings. It's a good idea to use the waiting room function. And all this is, is default now, so you'd have to turn these options off. Um, and those two things alone will, will greatly increase uh, security there. Uh, there was a vulnerability that had been discovered several weeks ago uh, where if someone clicked on a link that somebody posted in a chat room, it could potentially uh, be compromising uh, passwords, uh, but they fixed that fairly quickly. And that really just points back to a little common sense, right? So if a, if a stranger is, um, posting a link or shooting you an email or something like that, someone you don't know, not necessarily a good idea to just click on a link from a stranger, right? You might wanna make sure you have some idea of, of who that is or what's, what's coming to you uh, before you click on that. Uh, again, if you have questions, feel free to ask them in the chat bar or to use the uh, Q&A function. Um, so as a moderator, you definitely wanna make sure that you're controlling who can share uh, screens, who can share files, it's pretty easy to do now. There's a just a security button down at the bottom. You can click on that and you can change the settings there. Uh, more recently, there was another vulnerability discovered uh, for Zoom that had to do with uh, uh, Max, um, but is it uh, it's pretty arcane. Like it would require local access to the machine and possibly compromising uh, the installer with a fake installer and things like that. So, again, from a high level, what we're looking at really is. Um, if vulnerabilities are discovered, are they being addressed? And it looks like that's the case. And really, this is a good thing. Um, there's an enormous amount of people that are currently using the platform. And so with a lot more scrutiny, there's a lot more vulnerabilities being discovered. And that's okay. Um, I can promise you that all the other applications out there that do similar things have similar vulnerabilities that just haven't been discovered yet. Um, it's almost impossible to write code uh, that doesn't have any sort of uh, glitches in it at all, and really just taking advantage of a, of a glitch in code. All right, any other questions about Zoom before I move on? 
I don't see anything there, but feel free to, to pop it in if you have one later. All right, so what can we do to protect ourselves just in general, right? What are, what are some best practices here? So some best practices, one of the number one things you can do to protect yourself on any platform, any account is use multi-factor authentication, right? Sometimes called MFA, sometimes called two-factor authentication or 2FA. That's when you go to log into uh, an app or a website and besides having something like a username or a password, for example, it might require face ID, it might require a thumbprint, they might text you a code, they might email you a code, a robot might give you a call and tell you a code. All those different things are part of um, MFA, right? They wanna make sure that even if somebody has compromised your account, if they've somehow gotten a hold of your username and password, they still wouldn't be able to get in because they wouldn't have these other factors that are required to log in. If you can enable that for any uh, critical accounts, then you're gonna be much, much, much better off. That's the one of the number one things. Uh, I believe there was a article from Microsoft that came out uh, a few months back and they said something like 98% of compromised uh, email accounts that they looked at um, it, that would have been completely prevented if they had MFA turned on. That's a huge, huge number there. Um, so definitely something that all by itself is going to drastically improve your uh, security uh, posture, right? So for folks working remotely as well, we want to look at VPNs. Um, a lot of people talk at VPN, uh, talk about VPNs, but it seems like there's a little bit of confusion on what exactly they do. A VPN is really just an encrypted tunnel. So what does that mean? That means that any information that's passing back and forth through that tunnel can't be read by anybody else. So as opposed to being connected to a public Wi-Fi network where anybody can potentially sniff data out of the air, anything going through the VPN from your machine to the office or from one office to another office should be protected inside that tunnel. Now, just having a VPN by itself isn't necessarily uh, enough protection because sometimes businesses have the understanding that the VPN is going to fully protect everything and, and they're set, right? Anything coming from outside across that tunnel uh, isn't going to hurt them. But re again, all it really does is just prevent people from being able to listen in on that information. So let's say you're connecting from a laptop to the office. Well, if you get us on that laptop, God forbid, let's say you get ransomware, something like that, you've potentially opened a secure gateway, a secure hole right into the business from that laptop. In the rush to move the, some of our clients and some other businesses are saying, okay, well, we're gonna allow um, our employee to use their personal home computer or their personal laptop to be able to VPN into the, business, the office network, right? We have a problem with that because unless the machine is fully managed by an IT provider such as ourselves or whoever you're currently using, unless it's being properly monitored and maintained, we don't know anything about it, right? Anything could be happening on that machine. It's, it's unmonetized. It could already even be compromised. And we've just given it, um, you know, a highway, uh, a big old tunnel right into the core of our network. So all the action that's put in place on your internal network with the firewall and antivirus and um, all these other things might be useless because we've potentially just opened this giant hole into the network. So VPN is important, right? We want to prevent people from listening in on information going back and forth, but we have to be careful on how we use it and who is able to use it. So we have a list um, that uh, is gonna get sent out to you folks. Uh, it's a checklist to make sure that uh, remote machines using VPNs or connecting remotely are safe. So definitely make sure and look at that uh, information. Any other questions about VPNs before? Move on to the next one. You guys are quiet today. One of you guys are busy reading news at the same time I'm talking. So 
One of the easy ways that people get their accounts compromised is what they call credential use, or sometimes called credential stuffing. Hackers are smart. They understand that if you use a username and password to connect to, say, Amazon, say, uh, your email address and a particular password, it's possible you might have used that same information for your bank account or eBay, PayPal, Venmo, something like that. So they have script run in an automated fashion that simply grab these giant databases of usernames and passwords that have been gotten through some kind of a breach. When a large company gets hacked, they just simply dump it all into a database and it gets released on the dark web. So they run a tool or a script that just goes through every single one of those entries and tries it on multiples and enough, a significant chunk of them will work on other sites. So we want to make sure we're not reusing passwords. You're going to say, Ken, I've already got a hundred different passwords. How am I going to have a separate one for all the hundreds of different websites I use? We want to use something like a password manager. There's many, many, many different ones out there. Different ones have different features that might be better or worse for you and for your needs. So I won't recommend a specific one of research to your techie person. I'm happy to talk one-on-one -on -one with this. some of you if you want to hear about some of my experiences with different ones. But a secure password manager is going to take all those different usernames and passwords, store it in an encrypted database, and help you automatically fill those forms on websites and different apps when you try to log in. And it can even generate safe passwords for you, these long ones that you're never going to be able to remember, but that's okay. You're not going to need to remember it. It's going to be stored inside your password manager. So one of the common objections I hear when using a password manager is what happens when the uh, password manager itself is compromised when somebody hacks into my password manager? Well, let me put it to you this way. What's the alternative? The alternative is we are reusing passwords, which you've already explained is a very bad idea, or you're still gonna have to put them somewhere. People think they're clever and they'll put them in an Excel spreadsheet on the computer and call it something funny or a Word document or something, but hackers are smart. If they compromise your machine, they've got tools that can look for certain patterns that match usernames and passwords and they can search the entire hard drive and they'll find all that stuff. I do this myself when I'm doing uh, penetration testing or network vulnerability assessments. So it's not really good. Um, a password manager will at least store everything in an encrypted database. So if somebody steals that database, then they have a much, much, much more difficult time uh, getting hold of it. Uh, John asks, uh, John Levy asks us, a password manager knows all your passwords. How do we ask for recommendations in person? So it can be tricky, right? Because I don't expect you folks to be uh, technicians. You're all some uh, legal aid professionals. Check with your techie friends or, for, or with your uh, um, IT professionals that are already servicing your business and see what they recommend uh, based off of their experience. And do a little Googling too. Um, things change so quickly, you make sure you're only looking at articles that are from within the last year, maybe within the last six months. And if that seems like it's gonna be a good fit for you, look at different reviews of it. We wanna make sure that it's being updated regularly, that the different features and functionality that you want, that there's some secure way of backing it up, things like that. Um, John, let me know if that, uh, if that answers your question or not there. Um, so again, uh, secure manager, solution um, and it's much much better than the alternative i see a question has uh, popped up here uh, from neil it says regarding a vpn tech support at lacert tax preparation software company owned by intuit stated that a vpn can be slow processing have you noticed vpn impact regarding emails or browsing or logging into online webinars great question so a few questions there's a few things in there to unpack so if it's configured properly, a VPN doesn't need to redirect all traffic from your computer through an office environment, just the data that's trying to get back and forth to the office. So let's say you've got a network drive on an office machine and you need to access Word documents and Excel files. 
the VPN should only need to uh, grab that information and pass it back to you. So it shouldn't have an impact on emails or browsing or webinars, um, but some businesses choose to, uh, to redirect everything through the VPN. So instead of from your laptop going straight out to the internet, it has to go to your office and out through your office's internet. And they do that because they want to do their own uh, business filtering and scanning and things like that. Or it might just be a misconfiguration. So if that's the case for you, you want to check with them to make sure that they're doing that on purpose because that can really have an impact on, uh, on the speed for all those things. Uh, regarding the cert, it's a very good question. So it's sometimes not recommended to use uh, database driven software across a VPN. Uh, in fact, uh, QuickBooks had said in the past, uh, and I can see if that's still their opinion, but in the past they said, don't run it across a VPN because there's enough latency that is slow enough for the data to go across that VPN pipe that it can corruption in the database. Um, what's more preferred would be to VPN, like do remote desktop over a VPN. So you have your laptop or your home desktop and you remote into a, a computer that actually is sitting at the office or sitting in the cloud next to your, your other server and then work off of that. So you'd be running Lacert on that remote computer or QuickBooks on that remote computer. So as far as QuickBooks or Lacert is concerned, it is running local because it, it is on the remote um, uh, office network. You're just accessing it from another computer. Uh, so hopefully that, that answers your question. Um, if not, uh, let me know, I can try and clarify that for you. Um, but that would be the best practice for both of those. So I'll mark that as completed on there. Any other questions before I move on? Great, you guys are doing great today. Okay, so uh, since we're typically connecting from home, we're using a home router, right? Uh, a lot of home routers are just really nowhere near acceptable for um, IT security compared to a business grade device. And it's okay if all you're doing, doing is like browsing websites and streaming video and audio and things like that. But if we're gonna be doing critical business operations, then we wanna do at least some basic things to protect ourselves. And it's relatively simple, but we may need a technician to help us with this. But at the very least, you wanna change the default password on your router. Some routers out of the box are unable to be able to be accessed across the network. And every single router out there has a standard username and password out of the box to be able to log into it. Some of them are starting to change it to be randomized and they include it in a, in a card or something like that. Um, but a vast majority of home routers out there, the username is admin and the login is password or the username is admin and the login is admin. Um, and the idea is that to be easy to get into, that you would change it um, right away, but a lot of people don't do that. They take it out of the box, they plug it in, and everything works, and so they leave it. Also, make sure that buddy is updating the firmware, just like you have to update the, the software on your computer, or you have a company doing that for you, or your iPhone pops up, or your Android pops up from time to time and says it needs to be updated. There's a lot of security uh, bugs and vulnerabilities that are found, and same with your uh, home uh, router. So. You definitely don't want to um, just leave it sitting there because new vulnerabilities get discovered pretty regularly. And unless we're back them, you could have your entire home network wide open to possibly getting compromised remotely. Okay, got a couple of questions that popped in here. Uh, Mark asks your thoughts on password protected documents. So you can, uh, in Microsoft Word or Excel or some various other things, um, add a password to be able to protect somebody from opening or changing a document. Um, unfortunately, this provides very, very little protection. This is more of a casual protect. There are many tools out there that will allow you to strip or bypass those passwords. So it's fine if you want somebody from casually being able to access the document, but it's not considered um, like the be all end all or anything like that. If, if someone was uh, knew what they were doing and um, Actually grabbed a hold of a copy of that um, that uh, document they could definitely get into it all right and uh, Susan asks 
Some websites, particularly financial ones, often won't allow me to access my accounts while the VPN is on. Please comment on that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that sounds like a misconfiguration. I'm not sure about that one. Um, yeah, it could be an issue with, uh, like I won't get too technical, but some sort of an issue with SSL um, routing that causing a problem there. Uh, I would say one of two things. Um, probably the, the easiest solution there is if you're VPNing into an office network, again, remote desktop into an office machine and access the website on that machine, as opposed to accessing it from your local machine. Um, yeah, that would probably be the, the, the main way I would think of to, to fix that. Um, yeah. Sounds like there's a misconfiguration there. Um, I would definitely recommend uh, having your technician uh, check on that. Uh, let me know if that doesn't, if I misunderstood or if that doesn't uh, answer your question there, uh, Susan. Uh, Yirai, I hope I pronounced your name properly, um, asks, how can we protect a PDF document from being copied? Mm -hmm. That's tricky. Anybody that has access to a uh, physical digital copy of a document, right? They could theoretically make a copy of that. If you're asking, it depends on the different scenarios. So if I have a PDF on my computer, I could certainly copy it to a thumb drive uh, and then put it on another machine. There is software available called um, uh, DLP, Data Loss Protection Software, that things like disable the capability of copying to uh, USB drives or upload it to um, cloud uh, file storage services like Box or Dropbox or, or OneDrive or something like that. Um, and of course, there's also what we call the analog hole. I could open up a PDF on my computer and I can take a picture of it with my cell phone. How are you gonna stop me from doing that? It's pretty difficult. So the most secure way would be to play through a secure website um, where they don't actually have a copy of the document itself of the file on their machine. Once the file um, leaves your environment, there's very little you can do to protect it. So if, if I'm understanding your question uh, properly, you shouldn't really consider that a PDF file can't be copied because there's so many ways around that. All right, got some more questions coming in here. Uh, from Nadia, she asks, they ask, how do you know when your home router or your iPhone is hacked? It's a very difficult question. Um, I get asked that a lot. There's certain things you can look for. Um, it can be difficult as a non-technical person to tell, um, but uh, if you've been infected with malware, um, then you might get some sort of ad pop-ups. Um, you might notice odd slowdowns. Uh, when you try to go to a particular website, it might go to a different website, or you search for something in Google, and you go to click on a link, and it goes to a different website. Um, it can be fairly tricky. Uh, regarding an iPhone in particular, uh, current understanding is that if you're on the latest version of iOS of the iPhone operating software, um, there aren't currently uh, any uh, viruses that uh, are effective on there. So you should be pretty safe if you're up to date on that. Uh, Steve asks about LastPass. He says it's free and it's for you if, if wanted. Yes, uh, LastPass is fine. Um, I use that as well. Um, there are other solutions out there that, that work uh, very well. Um, LastPass may not be a good choice from a business standpoint um, because it doesn't have necessarily some of the features that a business might want for being able to control accounts for all the different users or tie it into to the domain and things like that, but it's a perfectly fine solution. Your eye clarifies, uh, thanks, I mean copy the content. Yeah, um, you can in a PDF, uh, there's an option to disable the capability of copying, that is being able to uh, drag your mouse along and control C, command C and, and copy and paste the content somewhere else so that you can turn off. But again, uh, someone who's really uh, interested or dedicated on trying to do that is gonna find a way around that. Aaron asks, is Google Drive a secure way to work remotely? That's a very broad question, right? So it's it, cool. And just like any other tool, there's ways that it can be used well and, and used not well. Um, it's a little too broad to be able to answer uh, yes or no. 
Um, you can use Google Drive securely if it's being uh, managed well. You want to make sure that anyone who's accessing it um, is configuring permissions properly so only the appropriate people can um, read or edit or copy files. You want to be cautious if you're generating share links on who you send them to, um, but it can be used in a secure fashion. It's a tool, it's like a hammer, right? You can use it for a lot of different things. Uh, let's see, John mentions in the chat, some banks use your IP address to confirm you, some VPNs change IP addresses to protect you. Yeah, okay, good point. And so exactly something like that could be uh, an issue. So if you're connecting across a VPN and they're using your IP address to confirm you, you might have to uh, add that location's IP address as an approved location. Um, a business uh, VPN is typically not gonna have uh, it's going to be a static IP. You're using something like NordVPN or one of those more like anonymizing VPNs. So people use, also use VPNs in a different way. Uh, they want to uh, be a little more anonymous in their web browsing. It doesn't add a ton of security necessarily to, to use a third-party uh, VPN if you're doing web browsing across it, and it can cause issues like that. So understand what it does and doesn't do for you. Um, yes, it gives you an encrypted tunnel, but if the website you're connecting to is connecting through like HTTPS or something like that, you kind of already have an encrypted tunnel anyway. So um, you want to figure out if that's exactly the right solution for, for what you're doing. Okay, uh, Anthony Lai asks, can you briefly exp explain the differences between enterprise level v VPN, uh, USA, I'm not sure, USHC, a sonic wall versus consumer VPNs. Oh, okay, yeah, so kind of along the lines of what I was already uh, talking about. So enterprise level VPN is really more an encrypted pipe to get from your remote machine into a home office uh, environment or to a corporate enterprise environment, whereas a consumer VPN is sometimes used to deliberately have a different IP address. So maybe you want to access content that's only available from another country. Like you want to watch Doctor Who on the BBC streaming website. So you choose a VPN that has a um, UK IP, or you just don't want any, your ISP or anyone else on your network to know what websites you're visiting. So you might do something like that. So hopefully that answers that question for you. A lot of questions, folks. Okay, I think I got through all the questions there, but feel free to keep them coming if you have more. So what else can we do to protect ourselves? Uh, let's see. Kulvinder Singh asks, Ken, is email encrypted? A text message. How do you deal with this if the other side is using Gmail or Yahoo.com? Uh, so there's a few things I think are being asked there. Email by itself isn't necessarily encrypted. You can have encrypted emails, and we use this terminology in a couple different ways, so it can be a little confusing. Encrypted uh, email connection is good in that anything passing through it is uh, difficult for somebody to listen into, um, but if somebody enters that message, then they can still potentially uh, access the contents. If you're trying to transfer a uh, critical document secure, um, what they call encrypted email, sometimes isn't even really an email. You get a link that says, hey, you have an encrypted message, and you have to log into a website or an app or something like that, ideally with multi-factor authentication like we talked about, and then you can view the, the content uh, right there. So the message doesn't actually go back and forth between people, it's held in a secure third-party location. Text messages are not encrypted, uh, however, um, if you're on an iPhone, iMessage uh, does have some encryption, there's also other apps that specifically do that. Um, how do you deal with this if the other side is using Gmail or Yahoo? Again, your best bet would be to use uh, an encrypted solution, uh, kind of like I talked about, right? So Office 365 has that capability uh, for sending encrypted messages, and it's a few bucks extra per month, depending on what license you have. Okay, so if you're a business and you have employees working remotely, they have to be managed machines. It's just not really an option for them to be able to use a home machine that you don't have any control over. Because if you're allowing them to log into company websites, company accounts, or you're allowing them to connect in through a VPN, 
you have no idea what's going on with the state of that machine. There could already be a hacker living on that machine that's watching everything that's happening. So we have to make sure that we've got tools in place on that machine that are monitoring, maintaining, keeping things up to date, giving us alerts there. Oh, I see a typo I missed. Uh, but uh, already 46% of employees admit they transfer files from work to home to work on. That's a problem with training, but it might also be a problem with the tools that we're using. If they're doing that and uh, they're not acting maliciously, then maybe we have a challenge with um, them uh, and their workflow, and we're not doing that well. Steve asks, how are the emails you send to clients grabbed by hackers to read and use? A few different ways, Steve. If someone's sitting on the same network as you, it's possible that they could intercept the data packets that you're sending and read them. Or if they're sitting on the same network as the client, they could possibly grab those emails, data packets, and read them. Or if they've compromised your, your email account or the client's email account, they could log into the account directly and access them. So again, multi-factor authentication to prevent something like that. And if you have critical information that must be kept secret, use an encrypted email uh, solution. And mark that as answered. End user cybersecurity training is absolutely a must. We don't really have the luxury anymore of just telling our staff like, well, don't worry about it, our, our IT guys got it. All the, all the geeks are paying attention to stuff. Like that's good, that should be happening, but no amount of technology, no amount of software or hardware is going to ultimately be able to prevent uh, a user from clicking a link in an email or opening an attachment that they shouldn't be because things are always going to potentially get through. The only way to prevent that entirely is to prevent them from receiving any sort of information in or out and can't really do business, right? That's the point of every, uh, of all these things is that we still have to be able to send and receive uh, messages here. So end user cybersecurity has to be ongoing. Uh, I've met, unfortunately, many businesses that I ask the question, hey, uh, are you guys doing any kind of cybersecurity? And they say, yes, absolutely. I say, great, tell me about it. And they're like, well, two years ago, we had a guy come in and talk for an hour, and so we're all trained up now. Okay, that's good. Uh, but threats change constantly. The hackers get smart, and they know that we get uh, wise to some of the tricks that they do. So they change them up, right? So we have to make sure that in an ongoing basis, Maybe monthly, it's a 10 minute or half hour or something like that, little bit of a training, even more so now that everybody, just about everybody's remote, they have to get some sort of training. Less than half of employees are reporting that they think that they get adequate training. So something to think about. Michael asks, how relatively difficult is it to penetrate commercial encrypted email solutions on a scale of high school through Chinese army? If we're talking about a, a proper commercial encrypted email solution, you're more in the Chinese army um, realm of things. That's definitely gonna require very, very, very high end capability. That's not something that uh, what we call like a script kitty um, or somebody who's just using um, tools that they grabbed off the internet are going to easily be able to do it. It takes uh, a fair amount of sophistication. Excuse me for a sec. Excuse me. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, what else we got? Ah, and compliance requirements are still going to have to be followed. So whether it's HIPAA, whether it's FINRA, whether it's Sarbanes-Oxley, whether it's PCI, whatever your compliance framework may be, if you have one, all those different items still apply even on these remote machines. So we want to be really careful to make sure that the machines are being uh, managed and everybody's still following all these important steps there. All right, how else can we protect ourselves? Every commercial solution out there has the capability of doing some enhanced email security. Um, for Microsoft 365, they call it ATP or Advanced Threat Protection. Google has their own solutions. There's lots of third-party solutions that are excellent, uh, but you wanna make sure you've got something going on that's doing some extra scrutiny to uh, emails coming in and out, looking for phishing, looking for ransomware, um, spoofed emails, all these different things. We have to keep in mind, hackers are really good at exploiting emotion, right? 
they know that someone who's new to the job, who has a lower level position, is probably going to be more motivated to uh, want to keep their job and to um, jump on something right away without necessarily putting a lot of thought into it that someone more experienced might. So they get an email from the boss that says, hey, I'm just about to jump on a plane. I really need you to do this for me. Please transfer funds from this account to the other account. A junior person might be like, oh, here's a chance for me to shine. I'm gonna be able to be the hero and help my boss and get this taken care of. And this happens daily. This still happens constantly, despite a lot of education happening and this being fairly well known a threat. Um, always make sure to verify a significant financial transaction uh, with voice or um, with a physical signature, not just an email, not just a text, because those things can possibly be exploited. But hackers know how to exploit this. Um, we still get people who call us up and say, well, my boss told me that they needed me to help them out and asked me to send them $200 in eBay gift cards. This is an actual case that somebody had brought to us. We're like, what? why on earth would, would your boss need $200 in eBay gift cards? Like, I, I don't know. They just asked for it and they were insistent, so I did it. Okay, let's figure out how much damage has been done. Um, but the hackers are really good at that, so keep that in mind. Throughout all of this, emotions are high. A lot of, some people aren't able to see all their loved ones. We're not able to go out and blow off steam. Some of us can't even go for a walk in the park right now. So we gotta keep communication strong. Keeping communication strong, checking in on the emotions of our team, of our coworkers, of our staff. It helps us keep that stress level down. And when stress and tension is at a lower level, we make better decisions, right? We're less likely to make uh, an emotion-based decision uh, that a hacker might be trying to actively exploit. And it's an important thing, the psychology of hacking. It's a, it's a very real thing. So make sure and check in regularly with your teams and see how they're doing. Um, encourage in this time, even though we can't see each other face to face in uh, the office like we normally do, encourage them to, you know, to check in, maybe do uh, a weekly or even more than once a week, uh, all hands on team meeting. Some businesses are doing um, like virtual happy hour kind of a thing. And uh, you know, it's a good way to keep the feeling of community and culture going and keep that stress level down. All right, that's a lot of different uh, simple, somewhat non-technical tips in there. If you need any help with that stuff, feel free to reach out to us at swiftchipinc.com. Um, you can find us on LinkedIn, you can find us on Facebook. Steve asks, uh, this is great information. How can we get an outline or copy of the PowerPoint slides for future reference? Um, I believe that the BHBA is uh, going to be passing uh, some of that stuff, uh, including a link to uh, some checklists that we're uh, handing out, some white papers on uh, some of these tips and more for things to look at for how to make sure a remote computer meets all the requirements for being secure and things like that. Let's see, Mark asks, what is your feeling about cybersecurity insurance? Not sure it is worth the paper is written on. Mark, I would agree with you if you're just simply checking a box. You absolutely want to talk to uh, an insurance professional who has specific knowledge of that area. And we tend to recommend standalone policies rather than a writer on an existing uh, E&O or liability policy because a lot of the writers are, again, simply checking boxes and have so many exclusions that they're not very useful. Um, that being said, we, um, I have a checklist, you know, of, of all these different security things that I need to make sure are in place for my clients. And it's, it's a requirement for us. We require, um, obviously we have it ourselves, um, but we require our clients to have it as well too. Um, you, it, it's very inexpensive and um, it's just part of the cost of doing business in, in uh, the time we live in right now. We have about, a little less than 10 minutes left, so I'm happy to continue answering some questions here. Hopefully this was useful information for you folks. If you find me on LinkedIn, uh, feel free to shoot me uh, a connection request. I'll, I'll be glad to accept it. Uh, post for
really little tips and tricks about uh, different things that you can do to protect yourselves. Uh, looks like we have a response here from Michael Viktorov. He says, as an insurance professional, I can tell you that cyber insurance companies may be able to, one, access forensic skills at short notice that keeps your local IT guy from screwing up, and two, may be able to negotiate reduced fines and penalties with OCR and et cetera. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you very much, Michael. Very, very good points um, all around. Uh, Kulvinder asks, do you have comments on BEP in the cloud? Um, yes, do it. Um, you want data to live in at least three locations on your machine or on the server where it's live and being accessed, right? Then you want a local backup and then you want an offsite backup as well. You want a local backup for convenience and speed. If it's a lot of data and I need to recover it, I want to be able to grab it quickly. However, it might not be very secure. If my server, if my, one of my computers gets infected with ransomware, it might also destroy that local backup. So encrypt well means just that bit of extra protection, especially God forbid fire, flood, earthquake, something like that. Um, so uh, definitely uh, back up in the cloud, make sure it's a solid solution that's doing exactly what you want it to do. Um, don't consider a backup a backup unless you actually practice the time recovering data out of it just to test. Francis says, uh, thank you for the presentation. You're very welcome, Francis. I'm very um, honored and happy to be able to share some knowledge with you folks. Neil asks, uh, I'm a CPA. I have a separate cybersecurity policy with Pace Professional helped me obtain. Excellent. Good job. And make sure uh, that they get looked at from time to time because things change. Technology changes and a policy that's the best one year might not be the best the next year. Lawrence asks, if someone has hacked into your system, is the perp able, uh, equally able to get into various software loaded there? For example, Excel, Word, WordPerfect, C drives, local drives, or is the perp limited to those systems open at the time of intrusion? That's a little bit of a complex The answer is possibly. So certainly they're gonna be able to get into anything that's open at the time of intrusion. However, Sometimes credentials are stored locally for various websites that you may have accessed past or various other networks you've connected to, even different user accounts. Uh, there's a capability of using tools like Mimikatz and some other things to dump credentials um, from the RAM of a computer. So maybe a technician jumped on that machine to do some updates and logged in as the administrator and then jumped out. Um, some of that information might be behind. So you have uh, kind of contact tracing a bit, um, similar to you know, what they're talking about with the virus to determine the possible depth of the uh, potential compromise there if, if that's happened. Okay, going through some of these other questions here. Uh, Terry asked, can you recap about security risks using a compromised home computer to use a commercial system, such as go to my PC to remotely access a workplace computer? Sure. If a remote computer has been compromised and that computer is in any way accessing uh, an office network, potentially that compromise could extend to the office network as well. With a VPN, you have a much wider variety of concerns because you've got encryption that's just open directly between one machine and the other. So they could access the entirety of the network. At least with something like go to my PC or log me in or what have you, if that machine has been um, compromised, the hacker would need to also have go to my PC or whatever the tool is open and connected at the same time and possibly need to take control. Like you'd probably notice that if you're using LogMeIn as a remote machine, um, you'd probably notice if somebody grabs a hold of the mouse and screwing things. Depending on what settings are turned on, they might be able to do some stuff with scripted background. It's tough to say. So it depends. Tom asks, does blue jeans have the same security, security concerns as Zoom? Absolutely. Um, I've only played with blue jeans a couple times because it's not super popular. The main reason people are finding security concerns on Zoom is because hundreds of thousands of people, uh, if not millions of people are using it right now. And so with enhanced scrutiny, there's gonna be a uh, much better capability of ending bugs. People haven't applied that same level of scrutiny to blue jeans. I promise you, 
if uh, just as many people were looking for security holes in it, they would find all kinds. And it's not because Zoom or BlueJeans is a bad product. It's just the nature of complex code. Um, so really what you wanna see is how does the company respond in those situations? So if uh, BlueJeans vul vulnerability were discovered, um, I would want to see them be patching it right away and hopefully they would. Uh, let's see, I think I answered all those questions there. We've got just a few more minutes here. Any other questions? Okay. Kenna, any final um, uh, words you wanted to uh, communicate with uh, the community? Well, I wanted to thank you for putting on this uh, excellent presentation and just a reminder for everybody uh, that you can reach out to Ken directly or SwiftChip for that matter. Their contact information is on their website and will be in the materials, which will be sent to you all tomorrow along with your MCLE certificate. And that's it. Awesome. Let's see, I see one. Oh, Steven says, thank you. You're very welcome. <clears throat> Can do a couple more here. We have a couple more minutes. Uh, you're welcome, Neil. Uh, Ellen says, what do you recommend for protecting confidentiality of phone communications? Um, you might want to use third-party apps uh, that enable uh, encrypted uh, messaging and encrypted phone conversations. There's a variety of different ones, and they change from time to time. Um, so there's tools like WhatsApp, there's tools like uh, Telegram. You might want to dig around a little bit and see what your phone supports and what's uh, currently new. Um, oh, I do, sorry, I just jumped over here and I see a couple hands raised. Uh, Seth uh, Spiewak, do you have a question? If you want to post it in chat or q and I see your hand is raised. I'm not sure if you still have a question. Oh, he's gone. I guess he doesn't have a question anymore. Okay. <laughs> No, you're very. All right, I think that's uh, well, folks. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Stay sane, and uh, hopefully, we'll all be able to uh, get back to being with our loved ones and enjoying each other's uh, businesses uh, soon. So, you guys take care and have a wonderful day.